thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is uh, Mohammed Youssef, and I am a managing partner at the Africa Catalytic Investment Partner. It is a Dutch-based investment advisory that focuses on uh, impact investing. We have a global experience in uh, impact investing across geographies and sectors. Uh, we have 12 team members, 11 nationalities, and more than uh, 10 plus billion of US dollars that have been mobilized or invested in different projects, transactions across the world. Um, I am I'm really honored to be here with you today. Um, and I, I really do mean this for several obvious reasons. One of them is what it takes to be where you are today, running companies. Um, it's one of the worst decisions you can actually take. It's, 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 it's actually tough. It needs stomach, stamina, um, and, and, and it's, not, it's not an easy decision at all. I have been in your shoes several times, and I am there today. So therefore, I am really honored and grateful for the opportunity. And I hope that I would learn from you as much as you would learn from me. Can I take out the mask? Okay. So, so I hope I'll learn from you as much as you would learn from me. And I hope that in the near future, we will get to meet either by supporting you in your venture or seeing you doing very well in the near future. Um, as I said, running a startup is one of the most difficult things to do. So if you think um, it's a paved road, it's a walk in the park, I would advise you to go find a job. It's not easy. Um, it takes time. It takes courage. You may lose friends, family members, social life altogether. But that's the reality of it. Um, so the session today is going to focus on um, investing in startups 101. So me and you are going to go on a, on a little journey is very focused on a few topics that I believe they are important for you as you grow through the corporate life cycle. Some of it will be from your own lens, how to look at investing and, and raising capital. Um, we'll talk about the ecosystem of the country, both in terms of the policy side as well as the money. And third, we're going to look at how investors see you and how do they approach a company in general. Um, we are not going to dive in details. We're not going to uh, go technical. However, this is just to provide you with an overview. And I believe your colleagues here in, in 249, they're working really hard in, in putting up different modules and sessions that would be helpful for you. Any questions so far? We're good. Okay. So let's get to know each other a little bit. Um, obviously, what you do is is of very strong interest to me. So the question for you is, why are you doing what you're doing? And so this should be a dynamic session where we get to know each other. So I need you to pitch yourself in 10 to 20 seconds of who you are as a person or a company, whichever, uh, whichever that you choose, in Arabic or in English, please do feel free. Who wants to start? Please go ahead. This side. Uh, yes. My name is Bilal. I'm a training maker in Saudi. We provide uh, Saudi healthcare digital and service providers yeah. with research and funding, like on any home appliances, like all the time positions, and uh, to provide the service for dementia and disability. Very good. I have an example for you to share today as one of the successful startups that I have seen. Anyone else? Please. I love you, man. <laughs> Who else? Why 
highly renewed uh, building. We believe in uh, the national development project starts with energy. So by providing such a product, we aim to scale this plan. We shall know. Okay. Well, please. Mohamed uh, Bakri, Thomas Zalib Adam Fari, he comes from Tanzania, he comes from Tanzania. Okay. The ladies. Anyone else? I'm going to sign up after the session. Huh? No, I'm serious. I've been looking for such service. So I have, I have two additional questions, and then I'll give you my introduction, and we'll move on. How many hours do you spend a day working on your startup? Or let's say a week. Anyone? How many hours do you spend a day working on your startup? The whole day. The whole day. 12 hours. 14, okay. 14 hours. Every single day. 40 hours. 40 hours a week. Okay. 48 hours a week. Very good. Um, and how many years, so far, how long have you been working on building your startup? Five months. Five months, okay. Five months? Okay. You guys? Three years. You're three years. And, wh and what do you do? Very nice, very nice, very nice. He's a good salesman. Huh? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, 
I personally do between 14 to 16 hours a day. Um, and I understand it's very exhausting, but it is what it takes. Um, I understand that most of you are in an early stage, so this session is going to be tailored around your needs. Uh, as I said, my name is Mohammed Youssef. I am currently a co-founder and a managing partner at the Africa Catalytic Investment Partners. Uh, we are a group of investment professionals who come from an investor background. And we came together to help companies um, in different stages to raise capital. Before that, I was with an institution called the Green Climate Fund. And it's one of the largest, and I think the renewable energy guys know it, one of the largest um, funding institutions that supports um, climate change, both on the mitigation and the adaptation side. Um, I was with the private equity team, leading most of the work on private equity funds and venture capital, so I invest in funds. But I have done uh, project finance and some investments in financial institutions. I also run a different venture at the same time here as part of an energy framework, so we need to talk. Uh, covering East Africa um, and we try to solve some of the distribution issues in the country as well as capital raising for projects. Uh, before that the story goes back I have been a uh, I've led two startups in 2010 2011 and 12 currently I'm also leading a few so let's get into it so the first thing is the corporate life cycle does anyone know what a corporate life cycle is okay so the corporate life cycle is where uh, you are today. So each company goes through different phases as it keeps growing. Um, as a company, once you're, uh, you're having, generating more revenue, you're acquiring more customers, your company is growing bigger, you start growing from a stage to another. Um, and, and this is so-called the corporate life cycle. And at each stage, you have access to different types of capital. So um, this has been a, a figure that is part of the blueprint of an initiative that is called the Climate Innovation Facility, which is a, a, a global initiative uh, or an investment vehicle that helps startups from ideation up until IPO. This part is, is only focusing on the uh, early stage side. So there is more, but I had to keep it focused. So from the very beginning, and, and this is used um, interchangeably between um, incubators and accelerators and investors and so on, so it, different titles can actually change. However, this is just an overview. Can you see? Okay. So it starts with um, pre-seed, seed, and, and then what we call an early stage. But when you say an early stage to an investor, you are a company uh, that is now able to, or looking for, an, for equity, and mainly Series A equity. And we will dive into what Series A means, and B and C and so on. So it starts from pre-seed and seed, and according to my understanding, you guys are in these two, pre-seed and seed stage. The pre-seed stage starts with ideation, it goes to, um, it, it, it starts with identifying what a startup is, but this is from the view of an investor. So at the very beginning, when they see that there's a good idea, they bring it on board and they start working on it. Slowly it goes down to you having a prototype. Once you have a clear business model, you have a good idea of what you want to do, and it moves up to uh, you slowly, slowly, you know, gather your data, understand the market, you have a clear solution, you know how to move on in the market, and then you start uh, developing a prototype. After that is where you reach a stage that you have a prototype or um, an initial product that you can test in the market and that's what people call a minimum viable product. So you put this out in the market, you test it and then you start changing with some of the features in your product to meet the, the needs and the demands for those who you are targeting. Slowly, slowly it goes down until you have a minimum marketable product. That's when you're fully out there in the market and you're gener generating some form of healthy cash flow. Now, at each stage, usually there is specific type of capital as a company you could observe. Um, it differs from a country or from an economy to another, uh, from a sector to another, but overall, this is how people look at it. And, and we will go into detail of um, at which stage you need what 
and how much can you access. But overall, as a summary, when you're at the pre-seed stage, uh, the only instrument that could technically work for you is uh, grants. So money that is given to you for you to build up some of the studies that you need, your business model, and so on and so forth. Once you go to the prototype stage, um, I've seen here in Sudan that even at this stage, a lot of people look for equity. Unfortunately, you're too small and too risky for equity, um, but still you are in need, so you give out a big portion of your company, and that's a problem. So we need to think together on, okay, where, on which stage am I, and what type of capital should I attract? At this particular stage, the seed stage, the best uh, type of instruments that could be available in developed economies, not here, is uh, the type of reimbursable grants, where they give you a grant and you pay it back based on a certain time frame as agreed, or as part of a bigger program. Uh, you could have access to zero sum coupon loans. So this is technically a loan, but you don't pay interest on that loan. Now when you look at it from an Islamic finance point of view, it's a problem, because they don't, they don't give you cash, they, they buy you stuff. However, we're speaking from uh, overall outside in general, you get access to a type of um, a loan that, is, that has no interest, loan tenor in terms of free payment that could help you develop your company and then you pay it back as you grow. There's a different type as well that's called convertible notes. And those convertible notes is when someone gives you a loan with the possibility to change it to equity in the future once you start growing. This type of money is usually found with friends and family. I know our family, uh, all our families are in tough positions nowadays, so you're not gonna find a lot of money that could you know, match technically the, the type of capital, or the size of capital that you're actually looking for. Uh, can you hear me well or should I change a little bit? Okay, okay. So, um, and then you'd have angel investors and some VCs that could possibly provide you with some money at this stage. Sam, any queries? Thank you. Okay. So um, these are, and then, and then you see some um, development agencies who have startup programs, um, just like I think Orange Corners, if I understand well, um, and they have a particular mandate to support building an ecosystem. And for that, based on the gap that they see, uh, they build a program which in some cases could provide you with some technical assistance, hiring people to help you build a business model, support you throughout your business, um, and give you some cash. But even that, you see different programs providing different types of money. Are we clear? Okay. So we move on a little bit. And then you get to the early stage side. And the early stage side is where the real tough game happens. It's not easy you will be grilled to actually get a penny. Those are the type of investors who seek returns. And usually, because you're a startup, there is a high mortality rate with startups. And this is how investors see you. So they get a pipeline of uh, probably in the hundreds of companies just like you. So there is some reason where you have to stand out and, 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 and be able to access that capital. At this stage, this is where you start becoming fundable. Before that, you are below investment grade. Now, what I mean here, and it's very important to understand it, there's one of the slides where we will see um, the mismatch between the capital available in the market versus the capital that, that matches your needs. So, um, and how do you get to the level where you actually have access to, to uh, to competitive uh, market rate type of instruments. So, so financial, uh, so capital, equity, debt, and so on, we call them financial instruments or products. And each of them has a specific provider. Like for example, the banks. The banks provide you with debt. It's not easy to find equity from a bank except for banks that are established to provide you with that. But the majority provide you with debt. And those guys don't like losing their money, so most of the money they give you, there has to be some form of collateral. And the collateral is the form of guarantee that in case you did not succeed in giving them back their money, they would seize that asset. 
Like for example, if you go to a bank today and you say, I want to buy, uh, let's say for example, a car. They would ask you, uh, how much is this car? And what type of guarantees do you have in place? Your house, form of asset. And those are, those are called collateral. And then you have the equity guys. The equity guys, these are guys who are willing to take risk. So they understand that you are a, you know, a newly established company. Um, and, and those could be VC, funds, angel investor, friends and family. They can all go into that category. They can be equity providers. Um, so they give you money uh, against a certain percentage of your company. So you need to understand those different types of products, how people think, uh, how each of the providers think, how they approach it, and so on. We're not going to go technical. Um, into defining these products, but at least this is an overview for you to understand. There is a lot of money out there. However, um, there's different types, different colors, different ways to approach it. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, do you understand what this is? Did anyone hear about the J curve? The J curve. J curve. دي بتشبه العلامة بتاعت النايكي يعني افتكر الناس كنت قاعد عينه لها كده وافتكروا انه دي نايك بس اتس نوت سو داي 1 وين اي كيم تو ذا فند اور وير اي يوز تو ورك ماي بوس هاد ا بيج بيكتشر اوف ا جي كيرف اند اي واز لايك واي داز هي هاف ا نايكي ساين اون ذا وول اند اي اسكت هيم اند هي سيد ذيس از ون اوف ذا موست امبورتنت ثينجز ذات يو ويل ريمبر فور يور انتاير كارير واي اند واي لوكينج ات كمبانيز So this J curve is a practical representation of all the stages that you go through, right from where you are now up until you actually exit. So you need to understand what the J curve is. Now let's unpack this holy graph a little bit. Um, if you see the same, the same um, slide that we had earlier, the pre-seed, seed, and so on and so forth, um, we, we, put the, we, we put them on top. Uh, to show you, so this represents the corporate life cycle, practically, where you are right now versus the process that you go through to build your company up until you reach a growth stage. Now, the most important in this graph is what they call the valley of death. They literally call it the valley of death. And they call it the valley of death because um, the majority of the companies particularly startups or any venture that is newly established, you start here by putting your own cash to build that company. So you spend money to uh, you know, build, uh, draft right studies, acquire a computer, buy a desk, and so on and so forth. All this is cost going out of your pocket, so you're actually going negative. So you're not adding money to yourself. Once you do that, your cash flow start going negative. So you don't have money yet. So you're actually spending, 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 spending. So you st your cash flow start declining until you reach the point where, okay, I still didn't sell. I reached the point where I build a product or I'm, 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 ab I'm about to be there uh, or I'm working on a product. And at that point, there is no money coming inside your or into your company by any means necessary. So a lot of companies, when they are at the valley of death, they simply give up and they leave. And that's why at the very beginning, I was telling you, you need to have stomach, stamina, um, because this is not an easy, an easy uh, decision that you've taken for being entrepreneurs. So if you see at the pre-seed and seed stage, that's when you still don't have an actual product, but you're losing money. You're paying a lot of money to build up your company, build up the product that you have, and you slowly, slowly start climbing up. Now, when you start climbing up, um, and let's say you achieved in acquiring some seed capital uh, to help you build a form of a prototype. And hypothetically speaking, you had access to grants. So you were lucky enough to have some form of money that would help you build a, a, a prototype, but you're still not out there in the market. Now, if you look at the, the, the market we have here, Sudan, there is a gap you might be in a position where you need more money than what microfinance institutions provide you. However, you're not there yet to get the type of money banks provide, which is highly collateral. So you don't have assets yet. And this is where uh, 
some of the biggest issues when it comes to capital, this gap, where to get that type of money? And this is a question that we will slowly, slowly talk about and find solutions for and brainstorm together. And I know uh, Ahmed and, and all the colleagues in 249 Startups have been working really hard in building initiatives that could really help fill in that gap. And we'll talk more and more detail. Are you bored, guys? Huh? Are we doing well? Okay. If you're sleepy, just tell me. Yeah? So the line below represents the holding period. Holding period means um, the amount of time where I have, uh, that I keep your shares with me until I exit. So, um, and, and going up there is the uh, cash flow or IRR. And, and there, as you see, you start losing cash until you start building more. One of the important graphs to unpack it a little bit more um, is, and, and this goes down to the psychology of those running startups. A lot of us think we have really good ideas, and we actually do. However, your perception of where you are right now versus the reality of where you are could differ. Now, based on uh, studies and data and so on and so forth, your expectations of where you are at the value of debt is actually here, much higher than where you actually are. So, and, and in this period in specific, there's a lot of pressure on you because you worked hard, but uh, I might not make it to tomorrow. You, be, you go broke, you have no money, and you don't have access to money, and then you start giving up, start finding other alternatives where you can fill in your time. And a lot of people drop their startups, and I think from experience, your friends um, or startups that you know who had very good ideas, but they didn't go anywhere. Uh, so it's that at that time where uh, you're at the valley of death is when you give up. So if you're stubborn enough, you're smart enough, you scratch your head and you find solutions and be persistent, you might actually get out of that deep hole. Now, um, so this is just a, um, a small example. And what's important here is that you need to be very realistic um, in understanding where your startup is and, and how you how you're growing versus uh, you know, the desired stage where you intend to be. Um, any questions so far? Any ideas? Anyone? Okay, let's move on. So the ecosystem and the capital mismatch. Um, in terms of the ecosystem, there is three things, and there's definitely more, um, but, and here I'm, talking about Sudan in particular, the three issues when it comes to the ecosystem. One of them is the lack of institutional frameworks and policies that would really um, assist startups as a key pillar to the economy. And many economies actually rely on innovation and ideas to build up their economies because you're actually building solutions, you're creating jobs, Although it takes time for you to, to do this, however, um, in many economies, they are a very important pillar. So therefore, there is sets of policies and frameworks that really helps you to grow and actually take that decision of being an entrepreneur uh, while being comfortable. Here, if you're an entrepreneur, you're in pain because if you, in one hand, um, there isn't enough uh, frameworks uh, or the type of policies that would allow you, for example, to access Funding, funding that would match your uh, needs. Two, you have high risk perception by investors and capital scarcity. Now, um, uh, investors are, and I'm frankly saying this, they're bullish. So even if you're a good company, you're still risky until they actually dive into what you do and get to know um, whether you know, you're performing well or not. Um, and then they go forward. However, in Sudan in particular, uh, there is high risk perception. If you're a startup and you're coming talking to me and you're saying, hey, I have this good idea, um, but I'm still not out there yet, there's so much risk around you that usually puts you at a disadvantage from the very beginning. Now, in addition to this, um, Sudan overall, and a lot of people would argue that, hey, the embargo is one issue, the embargo that we had, uh, the economic uh, distress that we're going through, the, 
that doesn't really allow for capital to be available. And I could argue the opposite because uh, there's a lot of companies here who do have a lot of money and institutions who, who are really performing well, relatively. Um, so therefore, uh, the right type of capital uh, could somehow or should be available to allow you to grow. And I know that one of the objectives, please correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't, it's one of the objectives of 249 startups to actually bridge this particular gap. So you guys are in a good place. Um, third is the lack of research and, and development uh, infrastructure or places to go to where you can actually spend a, quite a lot of time. And I know this premises is uh, giving you this. However, what I've seen outside is that even in universities, um, they provide you with this type of innovation support and, and a lot of them actually do have uh, funding support available. I have worked in, in, a, in a few initiatives. One of them had a Mexican university called Tec de Monterrey. And it's one of the big universities in Latin America that works on innovation. Um, and they have an, a university endowment. Do you know what an endowment means? Do you know what an endowment means? So it's, it's let me simplify. It's a, it's a, an institution uh, within an institution to manage the assets of the other institutions. For example, Khartoum University does have uh, an endowment. So they technically uh, make good use of the assets available to the university. So the money that the university is generating, whether it's public or private from the different fees that you guys pay, they get to use it um, uh, to, to build up their asset base as a university and expand and grow bigger and bigger and so on. So a lot of universities actually put in a little bit of money to support companies to grow, uh, push you to a stage where you have a prototype and then you go out to the market and look for, for the type of money that could be helpful to you. Um, so, so this is, I don't know, um, but so far, or I don't know enough. However, so far, what I have seen is uh, we lack in R&D. So we move on. So now the capital mismatch. As I said, um, you, until you actually have a product that is out there in the market, you need specific type of capital. And why do you need such specific type of capital? It's because of your ability to repay the type or the level of assets available, which is almost none, um, at this stage in particular, um, and plus the type, the level of risk that you have um, and the type of returns that you can generate. So um, therefore, you actually need so much hand-holding at the very beginning. And as I mentioned earlier, there are different types of capital that could help you bridge that gap and actually be able to build up a solid foundation and a startup. On the other hand, local investors, and um, this is, to simplify it a little bit, this is, let's say, specific towards Sudan. Um, the MFIs, the microfinance institutions, is somewhat missing in this, but this is, in general, the type of capital that you would see, either banks or companies who like what you do and they want to invest, or people who are close to you who are interested in investing. And usually, they understand two types of capital. One of them is equity and the other one is debt. And when they give you equity, they're actually looking for competitive returns, which is nonsense because you are not able to generate it. It takes time for you to be able to actually uh, deliver on such returns. Um, and the, there is a very high mortality rate. And mortality rate means that at any given point, at this startup stage, your company can go bust. So you go negative or you lose, uh, so you won't be able to repay. Now, the other part is highly collateralized uh, debt. And this is the debt that uh, the banks here provide. So usually it actually needs um, a form of a guarantee to provide you with that money. I've seen a, a few programs so far, um, and I think one of them has been done with 249 Startups, where um, a development agency supported b local banks here and those local banks to be able to support you. I've seen another initiative where, um, and this is one thing that we will also go into, your own um, understanding and learning and, and literacy in terms of uh, finance. 
So you could really understand when someone is telling you, I have money that I want to give you, you dive into the details and understand what does that mean beyond giving me a penny. Um, and this is really important. So you need to spend time actually understanding this so you won't fall into the trap of giving away a big portion of your company um, and be stuck in, in future rounds where you need to raise more money. So anyway, so, so this mismatch uh, puts you in a position where uh, you need to look for capital elsewhere or you work, you know, put in uh, triple the effort that you're putting here to be able to build up with the minimum resources that are available to you. And I know it's hard, however, um, you know, uh, it takes time to build an ecosystem, it takes time to educate investors, and it takes time to align a mandate of an institution versus what you're actually looking for. And I know that uh, colleagues here have been working really hard in, in bridging that gap, so it does take time. However, the point here is that there's a big mismatch between what is available, what should be available for you versus what is actually available. Are we good? You're not sleepy? Okay. Do you need a break? Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's move on. So capital and what does it take? So, okay, whatever I said is interesting, you like it, you understand a little bit more about what's going on. All right, then what do I need now to, to basically move forward? Um, I had a colleague of mine who is supposed to um, have an intervention uh, but he had his son in the hospital, so he wasn't able to make it. Uh, he's based in the Netherlands, and he invested uh, a great deal into SMEs. So he has that direct exposure into investing in, in, in small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, I wanted him to come on board. Unfortunately, uh, he's not, but if you don't mind, I can check my phone just for a single second. All right, let's move. Um, so getting ready, what do you really need? Uh, or, or let's say, you know, without going really technical on how to get capital, um, there are some areas that it's really good for you to focus on. And I know that you guys have done a lot of work and maybe whatever I'm saying now is something that you already know, um, but it's important also to repeat it again. And this is something usually when you are too zoomed in and too focused, into your company, uh, you know, either you don't have time or in, you're in too much pain that you can't even lift your head up and, and see and think bigger picture. So there are three things that I want to, uh, uh, I want to bring you to. Understand your capital needs. So what does this mean? Um, every successful company that grew successfully up until it reached the stage or it has a very good value in the market and is able to attract capital, early on in the process, they understood what type of capital do they need. Some startups, let's say they need debt more than they need equity, more than them giving out a portion of their company. And this is for many reasons. Some uh, startups would rather say, I need equity, someone who could take risk with me, push the company forward, increase the value, uh, or you know, make uh, healthy returns to some extent um, and then have the company be valued at a higher uh, uh, value or, a higher, or at a higher price. Um, this is one. Two, you need to understand your investor needs. So every investor you are approaching, it's never about the money they're giving you. It's more than that. This applies to you as a young startup or as a company at a late stage or even a project. So understanding, doing your homework on the investor that you are about to speak to is extremely important. Because you, for instance, you don't want to have an investor who doesn't share the same values as you do or the same uh, vision as you in the company. It causes you more pain to the point that sometimes you could actually give up. So um, this is one, you need to, if you are approaching an institution or an entity, for example, uh, told you, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing, let's talk, you need to understand where does your company align with their own um, interests or objectives or sector that they're focusing on. Or, so you are part of something they're looking for if you're doing very well. So you need to do that homework. You also need to understand how does your investor think, uh, 
in terms of uh, their view on a long-term long horizon basis? Um, uh, and where does that alignment actually happen? And then from there, you will be able to closely bring yourself closer to their interest in investing in companies. And this will really help you out in negotiating um, and getting a good deal for the type of capital or the amount of money you are looking for. And you will be able to look for an, uh, or you will be able to bring on board an additional element of support because it's always more than money. It's not just someone giving you money. It's always additional value that they bring on board to your company. And we will talk about more examples of this. Um, so this is, these are the two. Uh, the third one is be prepared. Uh, how many of you have a financial model? Good. Anyone else? Financial model. Forward-looking type of projection. Do you have that? Sort of. Okay. How many of you have a clear business plan? A very clear business plan. All of you? I don't see hands. Okay. That's much better. So, two things. You need to first map, or let's say think of the set of documentations. Because you, if, I, if I'm an investor today, and I ask you, walk me through your company, you'll give me an idea. But then if I ask you about how far are you, how, how are you performing so far, you're not going to tell me anything. Because basically you don't have anything ready to share. So you need to have those in place. And in addition to this, they have to be of a high degree of quality. So they have to look good. Um, and, and some investors are really critical with the details you provide them. Some of them are not. But the majority I'm exposed to are those who uh, would get frustrated when you put the dot between two words, not at the very end of one. So uh, I, for example, come from that world. Uh, so you need to be very critical in the things you do because it really reflects back to the type of company you have and who you are because technically your company and, and you're the one who built it, it's your identity or you are the identity. So have a high degree of quality material. Um, this applies to you now and it applies to you uh, tomorrow when you grow bigger. We raise capital, for example, for uh, companies across the world. And they always ask us, how long does it take you to raise capital? And we say, six to nine months on average. Um, but it really depends on how good the documents we have are. Um, so it plays a big role. So you might find a good company doing you know, good in the market. They want to raise capital, but they have terrible type of quality in the documents they provide you. And it really puts investors on limbo, creates a bad perception about you, so avoid that. Do we need a break? Are you sure? Yeah, okay, okay. All right, so um, what do investors seek in general? So if you, and, and this is mostly in, in developed markets. I haven't seen this here so far, but if you go to an impact investor who is interested in um, investing in SMEs in particular, you will see them looking at these six uh, points. One of them is that you have to have a track record of at least two years. And that's really important because it shows that you are committed, that you know the market, you know your product. Um, so it's really important. Uh, two, how profitable you are. You may not be that profit, however, you are generating income some, in, somehow. Um, three, forward-looking forward business plan and projection, projections model. And this is what people call financial model. The financial model takes into account, um, so you need to know, uh, I, I need to simplify. So um, it's how much money you're expecting to generate in the future. And usually people do it for five years or up to five years. Um, and, and then those are assumptions that you put there. Um, and then investors start auditing that financial model to understand where do you fall short in terms of your projection, how much money you are going to generate. This is really important. Even if you have an amazing idea, very glamorous, I need to know um, how are you going to sell in the near future. 
um, then a business plan really shows your strategy to achieve your objectives and whether they are realistic or not. Four, good management team. People like me, for example, they like to know more about you first. Who you are as a person, um, why are you doing what you're doing, what does it mean to you? Because in many cases, you know, a lot of people say, I'm doing this for the money, or they are in it for the money it makes. But startups have so many twists and turns, and a lot of people give up in the middle. So I need to know that I'm doing, or I'm getting um, in business with someone very reliable. So uh, in addition to this, how good the team is. Um, your experience, uh, your previous experience, where do you come from, your vision, uh, you as a person, um, how are you able to manage the company so far, you know, managing your own cash, and uh, how do you handle your liabilities, and so on and so forth. There is a lot there, but the summary here is that we look for a good management team. Five is at least uh, a positive EBITDA or uh, break even within six to nine months. Does anyone know what an EBITDA means? Can you say it? Okay, amortization. So, um, and the other side is uh, break even. Do you know what break even means? You all know what break even means? Okay, very good. So, so people look for um, when are you expect? When do you expect to break even? In, a, in an ideal scenario, if you show that you're able to break even between six to nine months, even if let's say uh, your earnings or EBITDA is still not there yet, it really shows that you know there is there is good prospect. So you need to demonstrate that, and usually that comes out in the model itself, uh, plus your financials. Your fin uh, well. In most cases, you don't have financials yet. So you don't have audited financials yet. You're still starting. So that's why within two to three years, from the time you're in the market, uh, that's when, and this is my advice to you as young companies, you buy a pencil, get a voucher, write down things. Don't spend money without keeping record of where you're spending your cash. This is really important, especially if you reach a stage where now you have uh, to be audited. And this is linked also to other future capital rounds. Do you know what capital rounds mean? Okay, so capital rounds are um, the stages where you as a company um, in need to access a different type of capital than what was available to you previously. So these are different rounds where you're actually raising more capital to expand, build your business, um, and make more money. So, um, and then nowadays, there is a very important element that almost all the institutional type of um, SME investors, they look for highly impactful um, companies. So if your idea is highly impactful in the market you're in, then you could be of interest to them because you're disruptive. And there are many examples um, that we have seen around the world where, and I'll, I have one example um, here with me as well, uh, for an innovative company that came up with a product and it's now disrupting the gas industry in Mexico. Um, this is just an example. So don't underestimate your ideas, but push on the boundaries to the point where you know uh, what you have is actually groundbreaking. This is just an opinion, and it doesn't apply to all of you because some of you can bring a, you know, a solution to a specific supply chain, or you fix something in specific where you see a gap. Um, one of you here said, uh, you were talking about garlic. So there's an issue, he's solving a problem um, in a sector. Some of you are bringing a new technology that would add value to an available product, let's say. For example, uh, you're doing solar, right? Yeah, and, and you're doing GPS tracking. Okay, and that is linked to overall GPS? Logistics. Logistics, yes. okay, that's very good. So you, you, you need to be, in addition to, to being a solution provider, so there is a problem you're solving, you can also be, um, uh, you can be
be a disruptive solution in a market where there is a dominant type of an approach to that particular sector. And we can start, you know, we can talk and give each other examples. And I think one thing I really want to do in this session is that we brainstorm together. If Ahmed allows Tawah. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, there are two examples that I want to share. One of them is similar to what you do. Um, so these companies have been um, invested in by funds that I know. One in Mexico and one is a French-based uh, impact investment fund uh, that focuses on East Africa. I don't have examples here, unfortunately, uh, because my focus is slightly different. However, um, these are portfolio companies from investors that I have worked with related to innovation as well. Um, so one is a uh, Konergies. Uh, it's a it's a group of companies specialized in air conditioning and and so on, and it was uh, invested in by INP. INP is a French-based private equity fund. Uh, they're they're an impact fund. They acquired 24.7 percent of this company at the very early stage. And then they, uh, the company grew drastically to the point that it's now acquired by EDF. I think some of you may know EDF. Um, and EDF is one of the big energy players in the world. And that basically, you know, you would see that, uh, and, and this took almost, I think they exited in 2019 or 18. Um, and that itself shows you that from 2012, where INP um, acquired those shares and provided them with equity, until the time they exited, the company really did transform. Um, uh, uh, in addition to the money, and this is very important, in many of the transactions that you would see in the example, if you go and read some of the information directly from the investor about the investment they make, or they made, along with the money, you'll see the type of support that they provided to that company. In this case, they did some restructuring, they, op they uh, opened up new markets to these guys, um, and they redefined some of the strategies they had. So this was one of the value additions that uh, an investor brought in with them, and it was successful. The second one is Solesto, and I personally know the fund manager who actually invested in this company, um, and I heard the story the first time and I thought he's joking until I actually started reading and I realized that these guys really grew to be disruptive. Uh, uh, the story is it's a 100% uh, solar thermal powered water boiler for households. Uh, this is a different market where you know, heating water uses gas um, and that itself uh, is a big market. However, having such a solution that is solar powered uh, very cheap, affordable to people. It really solved them cut down on the gas bills that they pay on a monthly basis. Um, so these students, uh, they were students, I believe, at the time, and they used to work in a garage building this solution. Now they're a very big company um, and expanding drastically nowadays. Um, so uh, the loose capital is the, is the fund manager. You can Google them. Um, they acquired uh, the product or the company and successfully this is the value that this fund brought in. They were able to help that company to reduce its cost by 50%. So the product itself became much more affordable to the end users. And by doing so, that company started scaling up and selling at scale. Um, and some of you, uh, this is also one of the things I'd love to learn about what you're doing, whether you are product centric, you have a product and you want to sell as much as possible, and or whether you are customer centric that you have a set of defined customers and your your solution you're developing your solution to them and then you will start developing more solutions around a loyal set of customers but anyway that that's not the point here um, so every investor in addition to um, investing the money there has to be value that they bring opening doors for you supporting you in certain areas and that's really important now uh, there is a point that I missed before we go to Q&A that I really want to tell you about is that um, and, and, and it's really important because it tells you more about how investors look at you. Usually this stage in particular, the early stage, it takes between one year to five years for you to be at a stage 
where uh, you can access equity funding up to five years. And that's a problem because it takes up to five years for you to reach a point where you're actually uh, generating healthy returns and you have a good position in the market. And that's when um, equity funds in particular, or some, to some extent VCs, would be interested in your venture. Now, the other problem that you need to understand and why you don't see more of that money coming into the country um, is because those funds, they have an investment period where all the money that is invested in their funds have to be, has to go out and be invested in companies. And usually that's between three to five years. And you need up to five years to be ready. So that's why in many cases, accessing PE funds or private equity funds is actually difficult. Now, as I said earlier, you will see a lot of these, I personally know many of them who would send you, um, they have the deals that are interesting to them. They're working on them or they're looking at them. Um, and the deals that are interesting, but they don't intend to invest in them. And you'll see a list of, uh, if, if it's a good fund, you'll see a big list of companies where they originate those transactions and they just stay there. Um, some funds could be interested in you in the near future, so they could, you know, somehow provide you with some help and not really provide you with, a, with an investment. Now, why? is it so important for them to select the right type of companies is because um, they hate losing money because it really reflects on their performance later on when they go out, when they close this fund and go out to raise another fund. So that's why they really look for um, investment grade type of startups that they could uh, invest in and successfully exit. And that's where, one, they make money, two, it's a good story for them that really helps them to, to go out there in the world and raise, and raise capital. Now, I don't know how far you understand how funds work, but usually uh, there's different types of fund, uh, funds focused on geographies, sectors, um, investment tickets. An investment ticket is the amount of money they um, usually put up or put out in a, in a company or in a particular company. So they have particular size that they invest. You need to understand those. Um, so this is what I thought is very important for you to, to, to understand. Um, I will stop here. Um, if you guys have any questions, there's one thing I also want to add. Don't give up. Be stubborn. It is, it is not easy to be in your place and this country, regardless of the difficulties that we're going through, I think in the near future, things will start changing. And that's when, um, you know, it, 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 we're, you're currently building that ecosystem. So sooner or later, you, I believe that you guys are going to be there. Um, I personally am more than happy to assist you with any advice that you need at any time. Uh, next time, I'm sure I'm going to be early, um, but, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to help. Thank you so much. Anyone? Ah, thank you. necessarily by ca in a case by case basis it could and what I mean is um, if you are at a stage where you need um, let's say the type of capital at a, at a, at a specific size to help you uh, uh, scale up your company then it's a problem but if you are a company let's say you have a product um, it takes it takes time for you to build. It doesn't require that much of, uh, let's say, capex for you to, for you to build. Then, not really, because it, it really differs from a company to another. Yes. Um, my question is uh, regarding the bike package. Uh, these dynamics are um, apparent dynamics that work everywhere in the world. Uh, from, your, from your perspective. 
How do you think that new dynamics uh, are different in this Tunisian system? Yeah. Okay. 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 I think that's a good question. Um, and it brought me back to a point that I missed. Um, so the first point that I, that I think is important is that Sudan lacks, or the Sudanese investors lack um, a, good, a good deal of understanding on, on the right type of capital that they should provide to startups. So let's say if you go to Egypt, for example, next door, you'll see so many different types of institutions focused on different sectors, different sizes and, and types of companies, and they provide different types of money. But that itself is also linked to a bigger issue. Now, uh, Sudan, for example, um, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why, um, although it's not, really, it's not really the main, but it's one of the, one of the big reasons why you don't have um, much access to capital that is coming from overseas. Um, and the issue is, uh, and I'll give you just an example. If you are a company um, operating in Sudan, a young company, and let's say you are so selling uh, GPS tracking systems to, let's say, Sudanese companies, you're getting paid in, US, in SDG, Sudanese pounds. However, an investor would usually invest in hard currency. How is your company valued? If you look at it from a valuation mode, your value, if you're valued in Sudanese pounds, comparing it to, to foreign currency, your value is too small for them to invest in. And that's a problem. Now, uh, would you accept an investment or capital in foreign currency? Would, would you pay dividends in foreign currency? Would you pay back money in foreign currency? How does, what does that mean for you as a company and your cash flows, which is a big problem? Now, that's why a lot of people, now I've heard some stories of, of companies where they had access, let's say, to uh, uh, some money in, in foreign currency. Here, small company. Now, there is a hype that happens when you hear you know, some form of numbers flowing into these companies. But there is, a, there is a bigger problem that you really need to think again and again and again before accepting that type of money. Now, if you look at the local market, as I mentioned, um, the most dominant type of financing available is actually debt through the uh, banking system. But still, there is a big mismatch between what you are looking for as a company versus what they can provide you, as well as the type of money that is available through, uh, let's say, microfinance institutions if you want to get some money from there. Um, although they're good in terms of performance, those microfinance institutions, but maybe you need more. So um, I hope this answers part of your question. Anyone else? You don't have any questions? Ah, go ahead. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 I think. So you can look at this in two ways. One, and one of them needs a more detailed, lengthy session, very specific on capital raising and specifically the type of value, the continuous type of value that shareholders should bring to the company in each capital round. What I mean is, let's say, for example, today I have a company that is valued as at $20,000, for example. And uh, I came to you and you liked the company and you said, hey, I'm giving you, let's say $10,000 for 50% of your company. Let's, or let's say $5,000. And you're acquiring 25, 30, 35% of my company depending on the negotiations that we have. This is a very bad example, by the way. So, um, so then as you grow, when you reach the next round, when you need more money, I'm gonna ask you a question. 
does that investor keep the same percentage? Does it go down? Huh? This, you, you invested in me, you gave me $5,000, yeah? And tomorrow, I need more money, I need 100,000. And I'm going out to raise capital, and let's say I'm acquiring new investors coming on board. And you have, let's say, when you invested that 5,000, I gave you 35% stake in my company. Now, when I'm accessing new investors, do you still have the same 5% in value or not? Okay, it depends on what? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. This is a very good answer. Anyone else who knows this answer? Do you guys all know it? I'm asking, don't be shy. If you don't know, just say you don't know. So th there is tag along and drag along um, uh, type of clause and contract. And that's one of the things that I think there should be a separate session that talks about it. And it tells you how to play around with that and how to align yourself in terms of interest with the investors that you, that you have. So back to your question, investors by default, uh, well, depending on the negotiations that you have in that contract, they have to bring more value as the company is growing. So in the next round, for you to maintain that 5% that you had from the beginning, it means you need to put more money to keep the same position. Now, in addition to this, the other side of your question, if I'm investing in you, um, then I'm interested in your venture. So I'm interested, technically, um, and, and sorry for being rude, I'm interested in not losing my money, and I'm interested in you making more money so I can make more money. Now, this creates some form of alignment in interest. I'm interested in the same thing you're interested in, which is your company growing and we have no electricity, but it's interesting. So, so, um, so, so there has to be some form of value. Um, maybe you're good. At this stage, uh, as a startup, you need a lot of hand-holding, especially if they're older than you, um, or you know, a company in the sector or have more experience than you. They would want to be uh, part of your growth. So in, in one way or another, they provide you with something depending on the gaps that they see. Um, and I can keep giving you more and more examples. So, so it's actually to the investor's interest to be part of uh, or an element of support to your company. I personally would advise you to look for investors who, um, who have similar interest to yours and similar vision and values because it is extremely painful to have someone, uh, it's extremely painful to have someone who doesn't share the same vision as you are. Uh, you always end up clashing, you always end up with problems, and those are stuff you don't need. Any other question? D did I answer your question? Please. Yes. Yes, I, I just have one question. Um, uh, it's very clearly, you know, up to now, Iran didn't have this platform of uh, supporting startups. I mean, it's very clear. Yes. I don't, but you do. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, but obviously, National Bank of Sudan uh, is not pushing to have like a local involved in that. There's a lot of tension around this decision that maybe to finance organizations where they need to hold money simply because of the bank to invest in Sudan for the market financing. 
So uh, you asked me a bundle of questions, <laughs> which is, no, which is good. Which is, no, no, it was, it was very good. It was very good. Um, look, these are uh, deep structural issues. And they go beyond a missing point. So it's everything you said is actually the problem. Um, but let's zoom in a little bit at each and every one of them to some extent. Okay. Like for example, uh, I, I don't know the banks, the microfinance institutions you mentioned, I don't know them. Okay. Uh, but the few that I was exposed to here, and, and they're not, they're, there's a handful of them that I know, um, they, the performance per se, uh, you, if you put yourself in their shoes, what performance means is not the type of money they give out. They give out. It's basically the, the non-performing ratio of money that they have put out and came back. Because as an institution, this is what they are grilled on. Yeah. So that ratio is very important. Um, so that's why you'll see um, some of them uh, have experience with the bottom of the pyramid where money comes back through specific streams that they are very aware of and, and their ability to pay back. Um, so we're looking at structural issues here. Now, I agree that there have been policies by the central bank uh, pushing the banks to have a specific percentage provided to MFIs. However, you still need to treat them the same, that um, you'd have a uh, uh, a non-performing loans ratio to the equity that they have, and that's an issue. So then you see where defaults are, and that affects, one, the, the, the payments they make to their shareholders and the value of the bank itself. So, so, so the, you need to think of these terms a little bit more and get to understand the psychology of why do they choose to put out money to secure type of uh, uh, assets or, or companies. Now, um, and, and you'd see that with every economic stage that we're getting into in, or we're going through in Sudan, the type of how they give out that money changes. So for example, uh, if you go to a bank now, they'll give you a, a, a debt for a year. And this has been very recent. The tenor for that debt is one year. This is very short. And in some cases, it actually goes lower than that. It, why are they doing that? Because it's the strategy that they have to navigate through the economic issues in the country. A more critical example to give you is that, for example, if you look at big banks here, or what we call big banks in the country, and I have seen uh, the financials of some of them who have been helping raising capital, you'd see them, uh, uh, three of the top I know, the value of the bank is $1.5 million. And, and that's too small compared to uh, the economy of a whole country. So, so they have to survive. They have to, they have to do what they do based on what they're doing. However, what you're saying, um, it, it, that type of change needs all the parties aligned in that vision of building a very solid ecosystem to make it work. Um, one example you said, which I think uh, you need to know more about, uh, there's also those development banks like AFDB and others. And those are triple A rated banks. So they're, they don't even, they don't, they're worse than our banks. They don't give you out money to, to, to lose. They could provide you with uh, some form of non-commercial instruments through programs that could deploy that money on commercial basis. However, they would avoid direct exposure to you given the risk profile that you have um, and they would mostly 
avoid providing you with commercial instruments like equity and debt because you're too risky. Zooming out a little bit more from what I have seen in, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we built what is so-called the Climate Innovation Facility. And it's a global program that um, helps bridging the gap between um, early stage uh, startups and working in that gap in particular that you were talking about. Um, bringing two sides to the same table um, and we have looked at those structural issue from a, issues from a global scale. In almost everywhere, you'll see similar or some part of the issues that you mentioned. Like for example, um, as I was saying earlier, funds, for example, private equity funds, where there's a lot of money there, um, they are uh, limited to a specific investment period. It takes a startup up to five years to be ready to access that money. They don't like tying up their capital. So they look for those who are ready. They don't like losing their money because it affects uh, the money they pay back to the investors who invested in them. So those terms, so every part you can zoom in and look at the issues there, um, or you can bundle all of them and start coming up with different solutions. Policies are one of them. Uh, the mechanisms to enforce these policies is another thing. Um, uh, building that ecosystem here, which that would provide companies with R&D facilities, for example, and some pocket money to be able to run their business is very important. But um, uh, is Sudan as a country, um, does it have uh, any form of institutional um, approach or an institutional type of use for a specific type of capital that startups need? Does it exist? No. Uh, and what I mean here is, for example, uh, building a, an actual institution within the country that is mandated to just provide you that type of money. It's not there. So if technically you would look for companies, um, uh, all these companies that exist in the market, to look for some money that could help you out. But then them, what they were exposed to is making money, not lose it. So they put their money, deploy it in assets that are actually secure. They also go out and bring capital from elsewhere to be able to expand their money. So technically, they don't really understand where you are coming from. Um, and that's a problem. Now, uh, personally, I see, and this is one of the reasons, um, and I'm not being nice, I'm being truthful. Uh, one of the reasons why I like this place is that I see you guys doing a big part of this. Um, and that will, soon enough Sudan will open up um, and, and having this ecosystem in place or some form of it makes a big difference than not having it when the country is open for foreign investments and that is really critical um, and you know there is so many details that we could get into too some of them that you touched upon like the risk profile for example of these banks now some of the banks have a better risk profile than the government uh, which is true. Now, if you look at this and you look at Sudan as a government, can the country itself go out and borrow money? No. Why? Because of the risk profile. Um, huh? very hard. It's very tough um, for many obvious reasons. So, so that's why you'd see that pushes down on the fiscal policy, that pushes down on the financial institution, that pushes down to you. So you need to find alternative ways, innovative ways, to bridge that gap. And no one else than you is better positioned in solving these problems. Uh, so it's rather a movement of a whole, uh, you know, all these different parties that come together. And I know for a fact that a lot of companies approach this from a CSR perspective nowadays. But soon enough, you're, it's in your hands to actually push it to a different angle and do things a bit differently. I hope I answered some of your questions. Thank you very much. Huh? Why do we skip the timeline of other countries where they progress and 
Okay. Tell me more about lean as a mean. Uh, I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. That's exactly what I feel like I feel I need to catch up. Instead of just focusing on importing this uh, yeah. foreign concept. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. I, I fully agree. Honestly, um, and this is a part that I didn't give that much thought yet, but I know it's a problem for you. Um, for example, if there is money available for you tomorrow, let's take an example, uh, Egyptian investors who are interested in investing in startups here or any form of investors abroad who are interested in bringing money here. One question that I laid out to you, and, I'm, and I, as I'm saying, I didn't think of it yet in detail. How would they invest in you? Is it going to be in hard currency or is it going to be in local currency? That's one Hard currency. Okay, then are you going to repay in hard currency or local currency? Local currency. Would they accept that? So, so it's not about when does it open up. It's, it's really what's available that could be an existing ecosystem, as you said, uh, where then when the country, op uh, the country op opens up, the value automatically goes higher, matching what the people from uh, or foreign investors would be interested in. So this is, this is, for example, one of, one of the questions. Now, you need to build value in local currency. Um, companies here, and this is, I think, and I might be wrong because I haven't, as I said, I didn't give it that much thought yet. But you need to uh, be valued in local currency um, and building local currency type of capital markets to help you grow. And if this is available, then it doesn't matter whether there is money coming from abroad or not, because there is money here in local currency. Uh, yes, there is many issues linked to this if you want to purchase things from abroad, but that becomes a different matter than investing in you as a company. Um, but so the point here is, if you successfully build, rather than focusing on, okay, foreign, 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 let's build something here uh, that is a very solid ecosystem pushes up or adds value to the whole economy, um, transform sectors, because some of the solutions that you have could actually be of a very val good value addition to specific sectors, um, which boosts uh, maybe uh, the way those companies in those sectors perform, just because of that simple solution that you got. Um, and now we're talking different about a different type of value. But for that to be available, you know, People need to come together and build that value, that understanding, um, and see how far it goes. But anyway, that's a very complex topic. I personally haven't given that much thought. Um, but one thing to mention here, one of the challenges there as well is um, there is what they call currency hedging. And hedging is where an investor wants to invest in foreign currency and an investee wants to be invested in in local currency. There are facilities in the middle who provide this as a service. So they guarantee a specific uh, rate uh, in the future to the investor uh, in foreign currency, and they provide you with the money in local currency. Uh, so they transfer that currency risk exposure that the investors would have. Now, this in most cases is expensive. It's an expensive product. Um, in Sudan, possibly the central bank could bridge that gap, but I have no clue if they have done it before or how is it done here. I know a few institutions abroad um, that I have I've been lucky enough to have the chance to work with them, but unfortunately our currency, because of its high volatility, they don't provide you with such hedging solutions. And that's another problem. Um, but anyway, so. Anyone else? I talk too much, or you make me talk too much. Go ahead. Allah ma sama. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> the soil quiz. Um, it depends on the investor. That's the first thing. Uh, it depends on the investor. Uh, uh, this is one. So that's why earlier I was saying you need to understand the investor you're approaching. And you need to understand them in, ter in terms of um, their investment thesis, of why they're investing in you, versus the type of money they would usually provide. And that's more of a technical question. But I'll give you a very, uh, uh, let's say, the best answer I could give you. Um, usually, for example, for the equity, and this differs from a market to another, an investor to another, can go competitively up to 18%, for example, over uh, the equity they invest in. So this is one. Uh, this is plus uh, the other incentives and the premiums that they could get. And as your value, the, co the value of your company grows, the value of their money also grows a little bit more. Um, versus the debt, uh, it's usually if, you're, if you say debt, immediately people understand banks because that's the main product they provide. And usually, uh, for example, in Sudan, banks uh, nowadays in foreign currency could provide you up to, I, and I might be wrong, 8%, 9%. This is in US, US uh, or hard currency. But uh, local currency, I think it goes 20, 20 something. Is, is that right? The debt provided by the banks, the interest rate. Yeah, yeah you see, so it's mad. It's, it's, it's madness. But uh, there are different investors, for example, who could, if you're a good company, uh, you have this groundbreaking type of solutions or you have a, a project that is amazing. Um, and let's say you successfully was able to bring on board a few investors who are interested, but you see that your projections doesn't show that you will provide them with that competitive type of uh, returns. So some investors are able to cap their returns at a certain rate to be able to compensate the other investors for that money. Uh, this is one form, but you'll see it very common in the impact world. Specific institutions provide this. The majority don't. Um, nowadays, for example, uh, you will see institutions. Uh, how do I turn this on? Okay. Did I press it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, and you'll see some institutions, for example, uh, the, the entity I used to work for before, they used to provide debt with very low interest rates, up to 1%. And this is to help um, financial institutions do something very specific or fix up certain rates, uh, certain, let's say, returns in a, in a particular project, in a particular project where there's a group of investors looking for specific um, range of returns, let's say, long tenors, meaning uh, the duration of which you need to re re repay the principal or, or repay the debt you took can go up to uh, from 10 to 15 years. But those are very specific. So you really need to understand what type of investors that, you, that you're talking to. Um, uh, some um, are built uh, by mandate to provide specific type of support. You'll see this even in, in the Netherlands. You'll see a lot of institutions who provide you this. Um, there is family offices who look for, or foundations who look for impactful type of companies or businesses and projects where they can provide you some form of support at the beginning so you won't go out in the market and get lost with the competitive or commercial type of instruments. So uh, does this answer your question? Anyone else? Go ahead. On a personal level, what would you invest in your family? Here? Uh, crazy stuff. I have made an investment into a, uh, a solar agency, but it was part of a bigger framework. I have invested in a game. Game. Yeah, so I, I have all sorts of different stuff. I've invested in a medical technology company. Uh, the game, for example, um, was valued at a $6 million pre-money. 
in one of those markets it targets is actually Sudan. But there's different ways and techniques where you can play around with those. But you need, you need some support uh, to help you build up that company in a way that could be attractive for anyone. Um, I'm interested in one company that I was looking at for a few years, and I don't know if they took off or not, is uh, electric cars. There's one in Khartoum University a few years back. I think you heard about it. Uh, I didn't hear about it anymore. So I was interested in those type of stuff. So anything crazy, disruptive, I, regardless of the particular sector. FinTech, to some extent. Um, so yeah, but in FinTech, I like disruptive, disruptive. We had a company that was back in 2011, it was I think one of the first who came with the mobile payment solutions in the country. 10, 11, something like that. So I like crazy stuff, um, if that answers your question. So, anyone else? I don't see the ladies asking any questions. Am I that boring? Any questions? Please. You mean only investors who provide you equity have interest over their money? Or, or you're saying, simplify the question a little bit so I can understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there is that type of money too. There is, there is, there is. But again, you need to map out all the investors uh, available to you who actually provide you with this. Um, there are many of them uh, around the world who would really invest not seeking returns. So you need to figure out uh, where to find them. Um, here in Sudan, I think companies tend to do it through CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, um, but it's limited, so you have to be really smart. now. There is also a lot of um, development agencies that their mandate is, let's say, um, impact, social change, and so on. And there is a lot. Uh, I don't know how many in Sudan, but I've seen a few of them here. Globally, there is a lot. But it really depends on what are you doing? What are you changing? The scale of that change, the scale of that impact, the replicability of it the scalability of it, and so many different metrics. So um, most of these institutions, they have impact measurement tools in place. So they take your assumptions, they put it into uh, their testing, um, and then if you are to that level of impact that you um, uh, are foreseeing, then they would technically support you. So, so there is a lot of money out there, but even the free money, it has specific targets where it's deployed. Do I answer your question? Please. Yeah, you're a track record. Yes. <laughs> Um, no, the reason why we say two or even three years, لأنه بيكون عندك financials الناس ممكن يحصل auditing. فهمت علي؟ يعني يعني عندك some form of uh, inflows and outflows and so on. No, في السنتين دي there are so many ways to answer your question. But the blunt answer is that you need to make money. You need to sell. So you need to exist in the market somehow. Um, so you need to exist. Um, and not even, let's say, you know, making healthy returns. Just exist in the market. Um, some startups take longer. Um, they don't make money in those two or three years. But usually, if you don't make money in two or three years, there's a problem. Um, 
some companies take more time. Like gaming, for example, take three to four or five years, six years sometimes, until you have a game out there. But that's different. So it's sector by sector, it differs. But usually, uh, in general, for the companies that uh, you as companies, two, three years is a good time for you to be out in the market. Uh, I don't know if, if colleagues here share the same view, but. Yeah, to two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To exist. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's that's a that's painful. Uh, two years uh, surviving is bad. Actually, two years. If you don't, if you're not in the market, generating some money. There's a problem. Yes, maybe you lack resources. But that's another problem. However, uh, you are uh, expected to be a superhero when you're running a company. And think of all these problems and try to find solutions for them. Because otherwise, two years is, a, it's, a, it's actually a long time. You'll, you'll be broke. Uh, but, but from the investment side, two years at minimum uh, for an SME to actually be able to have financials because at this stage you don't have financials yet to for people to look at you can have a model that is more forward looking but you don't have financials to be audited to see how your company is performing liabilities versus revenues and see that ratio how is it working you don't have it so you need two to three years to actually build something like this even if it's small however people can actually audit your company now within this two years they need to also know um, how did you perform on a non-financial basis, the type of uh, strategy you deployed, the issues that you went through, the hurdles that you have, uh, or the targets that you have achieved, and so on and so forth. They need to look at how you have been expanding as a team, um, and, and so on. So there is a lot of detail underneath. And I think uh, the good thing is, or I think what ne what's needed is to have a full modules where you can dive into each subject in detail and give you that full view. Um, so spend time understanding the financial side of things. It will save you a great deal of pain. Um, it will help you uh, understand who to speak with, how to speak with, what to get, how to get it. And that's really important because um, some, in some cases, you might value your company at, uh, like for example, I was telling you about the gaming company that I have, valued at six, six million pre-money. For a company that isn't generating money yet, that's too high. So if I go and talk to an investor, they will say, go home, get out of here. They wouldn't really accept it. So the value of the company versus what I need at that early stage is causing me a problem, for example. I'm just giving you a hypothetical example. I'm not having problems so far. So, so then they start negotiating the value they would get out of the money they would give you. So you need to understand how to play around with these tactics, how to negotiate, um, how to push the investor to a certain value in the future rather than now. Um, good. I have a question for you, man. I should ask you, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
that's a that's a that's a that's an essential question or an essential element in your growth as a company. So one uh, due diligence is what any investor would do to get to. Do you understand what due diligence is? Okay. What any or every investor would do to um, uh, to uh, get to understand your company, its financials, the documents you're providing, your performance so far. So they get to, um, let's say, um, they have a specific process in place that gives them a m more of a deeper dive into your company or day-to-day -to -day, day -day business. Um, and usually that differs from a company to another, from a sector to another. Uh, so that's one. Now, let's say you went through, the due diligence happens before an investor takes the decision of investing into your company. And usually, if you are at the due diligence stage, that means you, there is a, a very good opportunity that that investor would actually invest in you. Now, depending on uh, how good uh, the reporting comes out from your due diligence, it guarantees whether that investment is, that investor is actually very interested in, in your company or not. So on a global level, uh, due diligence, uh, there's different types of due diligence as well. You have a preliminary due diligence at the very beginning, and there is an actual on-site type of due diligence that an investor would do, where they meet you face to face, come to your premises, sit down, dig into your stuff before that, get to you know check, 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 check of everything that they see. Um, and then from there, they, there comes a, an investment decision. Now, usually the reporting is usually part of the contracts that you have in place. So you have uh, different type of reportings that you need to provide, whether it's on quarterly basis, whether it's on yearly basis, you have to stick to it. Uh, some investors would actually put you on default if you delay some reports or reporting. And I've seen these examples. So you need to make sure uh, that your sheets are clean you're doing a good business um, and report those um, depending on the, the reporting schedules that, that is agreed upon between you and the investor. So it's, I can't tell you how much having a, running a, a, a good clean business is important for you in the future. Every, this whole, everything in that investment process is interconnected. If you access money today and you grow, tomorrow you will need more money from elsewhere. And if you do a poor job somewhere and you try to hide it, somewhere, somehow, it will come up to the surface. And that would be a dead end for you. And investors will start running away from you. Now, uh, the world is really small. Once you access money from somewhere, everyone else will know that you have money that came into you. Um, so all eyes will be on you. So if you, if you do a good job in reporting, there will always be due diligence when you are accessing more money at later rounds. Um, so all your reporting has to be clean and clear and straightforward. So don't have, don't have two books in the future. That's one advice. People will find it. It, it will kill you. So be clean. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Huh? Are you okay? Okay, very good. Um, all right, any, any other questions? I'm sorry for taking long. Anything else? Um, nice. Okay. That's a very good question. Uh, that's a very good question. You need to, you need to, first of all, there is a principle you need to learn. Pushing expectations towards the reality of your needs. Um, as I said at the very beginning, investors are bullish. 
they need to make a good buck for their money, good value back. So, but your reality could always be different. So you need to first learn how to um, tailor and push investors' expectations toward your real needs in terms of capital. Now, before that, you need to have a realistic value for your company. If that value is realistic, and you and the investor both understand um, that this is the real value of the company, and then it's a matter of negotiating, and your techniques and your technique and your skills, and being able to navigate through. A good investor would think of you tomorrow, not their value today. Although they would think of their value uh, today and tomorrow, but the good ones, they think of you tomorrow. And they're in it for the long term. So, so they would, uh, I've known many investors who would come in, put money, um, and tell you, I can sell you back those shares in a, in a decent time, for example. So once you're set and you're good in the market, they exit. Um, so, so you really need to know, um, you know, value your company well, know exactly if you're talking about equity, how much do you intend to put out and why, why also versus what's available to you other than the equity and whether the equity itself is what you need or not. Um, if it is, you need to know how to push on um, or negotiate on that value in a way that benefits the business. Because at the end, you don't want an investor that, let's say, takes a big chunk of your equity. And these are examples that I have seen. So I have seen examples where you are, uh, and, uh, and, and it's, it's very sad and unfortunate, but this is the reality of Sudan, for example, and the investors here. Uh, you need some money to build a prototype. They know that this is a good company if this takes off. So they become greedy and they tell you, I need 45% of your company. You being short in cash, you'd say, you know what, why not? Sorry, but you, what you didn't think of at that moment is that down the line, as you are growing, you will need more money. You will be run out of your own company if this company reaches a level where there is much more money is needed. So, so you need to understand how to negotiate, how, what type of value to push out and what type of value to get in. Uh, and that needs a lot of learning. So my advice to you, learn finance as much as you can. Get to know how corporate finance works, the ins and outs from it, of it, um, uh, how to value your company, how to negotiate that valuation, how uh, to inject certain discount rates, for example, um, in your model, which technically a lot of people who know how to build financial models do that, which compensates uh, for the, ri the perceived risk that an investor is looking at, let's say, for example. Um, so finance, get to learn. Dedicate time. There's plenty of institutions. YouTube is one of them. There is a lot of good content there. Um, there is many platforms online where they provide you free courses. There is an institution called the Corporate Finance Institution. Uh, some courses are for free. They're really good. Um, they teach you from the basics to the very complex type of uh, type of concepts and how do they work. How do you build them and so on? It's really important that you know that. Learn how to sell. If you don't know, you have to learn. Literally, you become a sales force when you're running a company. You have to sell because there is no other way for you to make money. Um, learn how to manage a team well. And, and you need to learn the, those early on as you're growing so you can actually know how to expand. Why are you expanding? Why do I need this versus not having it? Um, and all the very best. Anything else? So I hope, um, I hope this session was useful. And I hope that I did learn from your questions a lot. The thoughts the gentleman in the back gave. I don't, I don't know your name. I am. I am. Thank you. So, um, and I've, I've been, I think um, one reason why I love this place as well is that I've seen good ideas and people who are really eager to push it. Um, so I am humbled. I did learn a lot. 
please keep up the good work. Do not give up. It's, it's painful. It, it's not a joke. Especially in Sudan, it's, it's extremely painful. You will go broke, you lose friends, family, you name it. But if you really believe in what you do and you see value in it, don't give up. Push. Um, there is always good people, some way or somewhere or another, who are willing to support you. Um, I, I personally, if you need advice, I'm there. If you have an interesting startup and you're crazy enough to push it to the future, I'm more than happy to be one of the investors you consider. I've been talking to Ahmed about it. Um, and there are, I know that there are initiatives that they're currently doing. Um, I don't want to speak more, although you guys make me tempted to do so. So I thank you very much for your time and your energy. And I look forward to seeing you in the near future being very successful. Thank you.